Welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. I tell you what, Blair, this is the first time we've ever done a pre-ferry flight show. And if you're going to do a ferry flight show, you want to do it right here from the tarmac. Of course, this is a unique location, but it's also a unique point in the timeline for the mission. We've done a launch show before, but we've never done a show about getting to the launch. That's right, Blair. Tomorrow morning, we're going to have two aircraft taking off from Vandenberg Air Force Base. The first one is going to be a charter flight. They're gonna, it's going to have all the ops uh, team, the science team, heading off to the Marshall Islands, and then about an hour and a half later, we're going to have the Stargazer taken off. But before they get to the Marshall Islands, they're going to take a quick stop in Hawaii. Uh, who doesn't want to take a pit <laughs> stop in Hawaii? But you know what? There's a lot of organizational activity around the ferry flight, and that's what we're going to focus on in the show today. Franklin is going to talk to Jessica Bailey. She's the lead mechanical engineer for the Pegasus rocket. And then I'm going to talk to Ed Dunlap, the senior program manager for the L-1011. And of course, you get to talk to Don Walters, the pilot. I can't wait for, uh, for that interview because uh, he, he does a great job when he flies that L-1011. Absolutely. And finally, we're going to have our very own Tiffany Nail and Mick Waltman. They're right behind us in the stair truck, and they're right next to the Pegasus rocket. And we always love hearing from uh, Tiffany, uh, Mick, and the LSP crew from a safe distance from the spacecraft. But we don't want to forget the science of the show. We're also going to talk about the ICON mission itself. Chris had a chance to sit down with Tom Emmel, the principal investigator for ICON in Berkeley, California. So Tom, why do we want to study the ionosphere? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good question. So the ionosphere is the densest plasma in space between us and the sun. And that plasma has a number of effects on uh, systems that we use every day. So the coolest part that I like about this particular mission is that you gotta have an understanding not only of the Earth's weather, but also space weather. Because they're really kind of combining, you know, in between the ionosphere. I mean, that must be really difficult or a challenge for you to kind of understand the ionosphere. That's right, so space weather is a, is a big topic and when it stirs up the ionosphere, it's hard to maybe see other sources that are driving these changes in the ionosphere. But 95% of the time, space weather is pretty benign and quiet. We don't have a space hurricane every day. We do find that the conditions in the ionosphere are hard to predict anyway. We think that's probably because there's another mechanism driving the ionosphere, and we think it's the lower atmosphere, actually. So when you have these storms coming towards the Earth, and you'll be able to make better predictions, let's say for GPS, for communication systems, because sometimes those will kind of get out of whack or they actually can get damaged during a, during a strong storm. Well, there's three sort of effects, but some of the major effects are, like you said, are, are communications, okay. because the ionosphere can get stirred up and become very variable, and then the, we generally use it to bounce signals off of all the time right. for long-range communications, and that can be adversely affected. Then there's geopositioning, okay. as you noted. So those users aren't bouncing signals off the ionosphere. They're trying to penetrate the ionosphere okay. from GPS satellites. And those signals can become scrambled as well. And that can affect everyone from people who are trying to drive a combine with a GPS to airlines. Okay. And then the third users focused on space weather are power and utilities. So all those currents that the utilities are worried about are currents that are driven because there's current overhead in the ionosphere. So being able to predict that condition in the ionosphere is key for those power operators as well. Now, when we're talking about the ionosphere, what kind of range are we talking about in the atmosphere? So that's a good question. So in the daytime, the ionosphere is about 100 kilometers up, or 62 miles. That's where the plasma starts. And it goes all the way up to a big peak, about 300 kilometers. The nighttime, the lower ionosphere sort of disappears. It recombines. The sun's not driving anymore. Okay. But the upper ionosphere just sits there. And that's what you use to bounce signals off of at nighttime. So it's easier to communicate at night that's right. than it is during the daytime. If you've listened to shortwave radio, you can get Radio Moscow or Radio Tehran in the middle of the night. You can't get that in the daytime. You can't get it in the daytime. Now, Tom, as the principal investigator of this mission, what is your ultimate question that you want to answer? What I want to understand is, why the ionosphere is completely different one day to the next. And we've tried to model it. We've tried to, we don't have the measurements. 
You'd have to guess. And then maybe you're right or maybe you're wrong. Why is it doing that? So we've never had the data in the daytime and the complement of instruments at the same place at the same time to even approach that question. Uh, we're joined on set right now by Jessica Bailey, who was the Pegasus lead mechanical integration and test engineer. Jessica, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I understand you were in charge of the mating process between the Pegasus and the L-1011. Tell us a little I bit about was. that process. Absolutely. So uh, after we transported the Pegasus rocket out here, the L-1011 crew had already had a Stargaze, Stargazer L-1011 jacked in the air about three feet. So the landing gear, the nose gear, everything, the entire aircraft is raised three feet in the air to allow us to actually drive our Pegasus on our trailer underneath the aircraft and allow for motion for the actual mating of the Pegasus to the plane. Now that's not a process that needs to take place inside of a hangar. You actually did that right out here on the hot pad. Yes, we did, we did, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about the, the Pegasus rocket and as far as fueling is concerned. I understand this, this rocket is already fueled and it's not fueled like later, right before the launch. Right, so these actually are solid rocket motors. Uh, they're manufactured in our uh, propulsion services division up in uh, Bacchus, Utah. And so the, it's a very stable fuel. So the motors come to us at Vandenberg fully fueled and uh, we attach to the uh, plane with that. The fuel stays uh, as part of the rocket for all that time. And uh, when we go to launch, we ignite that fuel. Now, thinking about this ferry process from here to uh, Kwajalein, are there any you know, engineering obstacles that you have to overcome to see this process through? Uh, you know, actually the ferry, uh, we do have one thing. So because we are launching from uh, Kwajalein, we do actually have to have a layover at Hickam, uh, which is on Oahu in Hawaii. Oh, man. I know, tough, <laughs> tough job <laughs> tough we have. Job, right? <laughs> but we have to uh, refuel the plane and then uh, re, uh, refill the nitrogen tanks because we are running a constant nitrogen purge on the uh, spacecraft inside the ferry to keep, keep the Icon spacecraft uh, nice and happy. Now, there was some testing going on when we got out here a couple of days ago to the hot pad. Can you tell us what type of testing that has gone on here uh, over the past couple of days? Yeah, so we, uh, yesterday, we finished up the combined system test. So that is the first test that we do of the uh, the Orbital ATK Stargazer L-1011, the uh, Orbital ATK built uh, Pegasus rocket, and then the Orbital ATK built uh, satellites. Uh, right. So this is that's another exciting thing about this mission is that everything is orbital ATK. So it's a 100% orbital ATK mission. Hey, well, Jessica, glad to have you on the show. Wish you and your team a safe flight out to Kwajalein, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right, thank you so much. Right now, uh, we're gonna go to an interview that Blair did with Ellen Taylor over at Berkeley. Ellen, as systems engineer on a project like ICON, tell me a little bit about the challenges you faced. So I think the project like ICON is actually is challenging, but it's also a lot of fun. And one of the unique things about what we did for ICON was we brought a whole bunch of different instruments together. A lot of the instruments have been flown before. They are heritage instruments. But the unique thing is putting them all together into one package, into a very small space. So one of the things that we did was put all of these different instruments on a single platform. And they had to all look at, have their different field of views, make sure that they were looking where they were supposed to. I guess that's a big part of the challenge when you have these science requirements and yet you've got, you have to fit all these instruments in. H how do you work with the scientists to make sure that those objectives aren't compromised when you're trying to fit this unique launch vehicle? I think it's a lot of give and take. I mean, I think we have a lot of discussion with the scientists and trying to figure out exactly what they want and the requirements that they need from these different instruments. And so I think it's a lot of back and forth. I think there's initially, you know, some these are the requirements and we go back and tell them, you know, this, it's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. And because of the different, you know, the way that things have to come together, then they come back to us and, you know, we kind of just figure it out as we go along. What are the kinds of instruments that you actually ended up putting on the final version of ICON? So there's three imagers and then one ion velocity meter, the IVM, and that's from UT Dallas. The instrument is actually taking measurements right at the spacecraft. The other Im imagers are, one's a Mickelson interferometer, that's called the Mighty Instrument from <laughs> NRL. And then there's a far ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet instrument. The far ultraviolet is FUV, that was built here at Berkeley, as was the EUV, which was the extreme ultraviolet instrument. 
How will you transition uh, once you're launched and once you're in space to getting to an operational phase, if you will? Tell us a little bit about that process. So that's actually one of my favorite processes. I I love the you know the couple of days, couple of um, weeks right after. Uh, we launch, and so the Mission Operations Center, which is here at UC Berkeley, we initially, you know, watch the launch. There's some very minor commanding, a lot of the initial work for the spacecraft, which is kind of deploying the solar arrays, um, that's actually all done autonomously. So we're not doing that through commanding. But then after that, kind of day by day, we start to bring both the spacecraft and then also the different instruments online. And so it's initially 24-7 operations. We're talking to the instruments and the spacecraft kind of as many times as we can, as many times as we see it go overhead. And then we kind of back off after a month after launch, we sort of back off and kind of let the scientists come in and do their job and we step away and hopefully everything's working. Now let's say, you know, six months into the mission, they're getting some data and they see interesting things and they, they want to change things. Are, are you still involved at that point or how does that work? Absolutely. So we're, you know, it's, it's, there's an advantage in that a lot of the engineers that built the ICON and built the instruments are actually here at Berkeley. And so that's also where the mission operations is and that's also where the scientists are. And so there is a lot of, we want to change different high voltage settings or if we want to, you know, to have the spacecraft do something else. So we have all that capability here and we just go down down the hall and the scientists can come talk to us or pulled in. <laughs> That's great. Now I've got one, one more question for you in particular. So you've helped put all this together and help the scientists meet their objectives. When do you say it's done, I'm, I'm finished and uh, good job? Um, so it's a good question. So I think a very exciting moment is right at launch. I think a very satisfy satisfying time is after you hear back from the scientists and you kind of, you see a lot of the papers published and you kind of see that going on and, you know, even 10 years down the road, you know, just you kind of hear and you know of new discoveries that are coming out and that's makes it very satisfying. Joining us now is Ed Dunlap, who's the Senior Program Manager for the L-1011. The last time we spoke, Ed, it was before the Cygnus mission, which took place or launched uh, out of Florida, out of the Cape. Uh, how is something like going to Kwajalein different from an operation standpoint? Yeah, good question. So basically from a rocket standpoint I, and, and how we um, prep the airplane, it's the same. But logistically, it's hugely different. I mean, for one thing, we're going out of the country. And uh, it makes you appreciate just what an airline does for you, taking care of all the details. For example, TSA, leaving, getting back into country. Uh, even though we're going to a military installation, we're leaving the U.S. and going to the Quad the Marshall Islands. So we have to export everything and then import the things that we're bringing back. Not the rocket, of course, but everything else that we have on the airplane. Yeah, do you have uh, to explain that? Like how you're taking this big asset out yes, of the country and then you're so. not returning with it? In great detail. <laughs> and uh, very thankful for a lot of people that we have that know how to navigate those processes with the government to be able to get that done. And I, I imagine uh, when you're at Kwajalein and you take off, like how far do you have to fly out into the, or over the ocean rather, uh, to ma actually make the launch? Yeah, in this particular case, uh, we're normally, we're about 90 miles off the coast. I think we're about 120 miles. Uh, I think that's about it for, for Kwajalein. So it's a little bit further. And then of course it's night. So you're out over the middle of the Pacific Ocean at night. Uh, so uh, highly dependent on our navigation systems and things like that that we have on board. And of course, it's a much shorter runway in Kwajalein than any place else we operate. Well, and I, I noticed just as a layman that the Pegasus doesn't clear the ground very much, so landing no. has got to be very challenging. You know, from a, I think, and the pilots can of course answer it a lot better than I can, but I think from a, uh, the way they fly the airplane, it's really not a whole lot different. Of course, they want to be very gentle yeah. uh, when landing. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Of course, now I'm wondering, like, are you actually going? What kind of team are you actually taking out to yeah. Kwajalein? Uh, well, uh, of course, we have the Pegasus team, which includes the rocket engineers and launch panel operators and ground support technicians. In addition to that, from my perspective, we have aircraft technicians that we have to take because, again, as same thing with any place we launch from, we have to have 24-hour coverage. So from the time that rocket was on the airplane, there's somebody from uh, the rocket side and also from the airplane side on the airplane 24 hours a day. In addition to that, I'm responsible for uh, making sure the flight crew is trained and ready. And so we've used the simulator, as you saw yeah, the yeah. last time we were together. Uh, we've used the simulator, not only to get the flight crew current, but to practice the launch and the launch profile. Remember, this is a three person crew. We have a flight engineer position because we don't do that many launches. We like to get them the experience of uh, what it's like. So we have two full crews on board as well. How do you determine who gets to fly during the drop? 
Uh, you know, I leave that one up to the chief pilot. Oh. I, and I'm sure he's qualified. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Well, listen, thanks so much for being on the show, Ed. We really appreciate it. We always love hearing from you guys because it's a, a very important part of the process that we don't see very often. Again, thanks. Thank you. Now, the pilots are a very professional group, as you know, but they're also, they also like to have a little bit of fun. So uh, we had the unique opportunity of getting a look inside the cockpit during a recent taxi of the L-1011. Let's check it out. NASA 3.14159, you're cleared for takeoff. NASA Pi, roger. Huh? Contact departure control. Roger. Huh? Request vector clearance, over. What? Your vector is 270. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, roger. What's our vector, Victor? Tower radio clearance, over. That's clearance, over. Over. Roger. Huh? Roger, over. What? Huh? Who? Hey, joining us now is Don Walters, uh, the pilot of the uh, Stargazer. How you doing, Don? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. Are you pretty excited about tomorrow's launch? I, we are. We, are, we are, My entire crew and I are just totally excited. This is what we live for. This is what we practice for, and uh, we are ready to go. Now, how many times have you flown in this L-1011? Uh, I've been flying the L-1011 since the mid-'80s. Uh, this L-1011 I came with Orbital about 10 years ago, and this will be my seventh launch. Now, I understand that this is the last American L-1011 in existence? Yeah, so over the years, the uh, airplane has been attritioned out of the airline business. Uh, Orbital bought this for a specific pur purpose 25 years ago and is maintaining it, but it is the last U.S. registered L-1011 left flying. Now, what's, what, is, uh, what makes this uh, L-1011 unique to the Pegasus launch vehicle? Well, uh, back when they came up with the idea of launching a rocket from an aircraft, they went in search of an aircraft that could do this. The L-1011 has the unique, a couple of unique characteristics. One, if you take a look back at the airplane, it's high enough off the ground that we can actually put a rocket underneath it. And the second, the way that the airplane is designed, it has two stringers, which we call keel beams, that run down the entire length of the airplane. And the rocket has a fin, which fits neatly between these two. So by accident and with some modification, it's the perfect airplane to do what we do. So kind of take us through uh, game day. You're, you're getting ready to launch. What's, what's kind of the, the prep? What's your mindset on launch day? Well, it's a very long day, uh, very scripted. So uh, on the launch day, our launch is going to be about 2 o'clock in the morning. So we'll get out to the airplane probably about 8 that evening and follow. It, it's a very long, calm procedure to get the aircraft and the crew and all of the systems transferred from all this ground support equipment you can see onto the airplane. Right. And then uh, we go through several rehearsals in our mind. Right, right. And uh, it's a 59-minute flight from the runway in Quadrilane, a very precise kind of a racetrack pattern, okay. if you will, uh, to the launch point. Now, you're, you say you talk about this racetrack pattern. So what's the launch window for, for this mission? Uh, the launch window has been changing, but uh, I believe that our launch window is 38 minutes, and that's di dictated basically by uh, the amount of time it takes the rocket to fly over other air traffic and how long right. ATC is willing to keep it clear. Now, are you going in a, in, a, in a circle test track, or is it a figure eight? What kind, what kind of pattern do you guys fly? Well, I mean, if you just picture a high school racetrack. Okay. <laughs> so you're like it's a NASCAR some, driver. You're left, like a NASCAR turns, driver left at, turns yeah, at only. eight miles per minute. <laughs> Now, Don, I want to thank you so much for taking your time out. I know you're a very busy person being a chief test pilot here for this mission to come out and talk with us today, and I really appreciate that. And have a great flight to the Marshall Islands and enjoy that, that day in Hawaii. Absolutely. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, we've been talking about the L-1011 and the Pegasus, but you know, our very own Tiffy now and Mick Waltman, they're right behind the stair truck, and they're right next to the uh, Pegasus rocket. Tiffany? Chris, we are 18 feet from the Pegasus XL rocket. One doesn't get typical access like this to the Pegasus, so thank you Orbital ATK for this access. Mick, why did LSP select the Pegasus XL for the ICON mission? So you know, Pegasus XL is a unique vehicle and LSP usually uh, selects the vehicle for the spacecraft and in this case, due to the size of the vehicle and the orbit that was required for ICON, we chose the Pegasus launch vehicle. One of the other unique things about that is we can pretty much launch this vehicle from anywhere in the world, Tiffany. Now, Mick, you point up a good point. Where has NASA, what is our history? How many missions have we matched the Pegasus XL and launched? And where are the locations that we launched from? 
You know, we do have a long-standing relationship with Orbital ATK on the Pegasus vehicle. This will be our 21st Pegasus XL with Orbital ATK. Um, we have launched vehicles from all over the place. Uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, Vandenberg Air Force Station right here in California where we are today, and of course the Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands, which is we're heading to for ICON. So it's an exciting time to be this close to the rocket, standing right here underneath Stargazer, the mighty L-1011. I'm, I'm excited to be here. So I have to point out to the audience, the weather we're seeing right here for Vandenberg is phenomenal. And this is not your typical weather, is it, Mick? No, Tiffany, it's not. You know, the hot pad is right here out at the airfield at Vandenberg Air Force Base. We're, we're just right off the Pacific Ocean. So normally what we see here is we got wind blowing down the airfield. We've got fog. Normally you'll see the engineering teams working. They'll be bundled up in jackets and, and hoodies. Today is an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful California day to get ready to load up and prep for ferry flight. I think you brought us a little luck with the weather here from Florida today. I will totally own that. Thank <laughs> you. So let's talk about, well, we talked about the history. Let's talk about now, where are you going to be? Tomorrow is the big event, the ferry flight. Let's talk about the ferry flight and then where are you gonna be for launch day? So yeah, tomorrow we ferry flight uh, from Vandenberg. Uh, we'll ferry to Honolulu, Hawaii and then we'll ferry to the Kwajalein Islands. It's about six hours to Honolulu and about six hours to Quad. So it's a long flight for Pegasus. Um, we're loading the L-1011 today and prepping for that ferry flight tomorrow. Myself and the engineering team uh, that I'm part of, Orbital ATK and NASA LSP, we'll be flying in another plane that'll take off just prior to the L-1011 in Pegasus. And part of our job there is as to, to lead the way is to determine wind and turbulence and weather can, stuff that's going on in the air and kind of feed that back to the pilot, Don Walter, who you, we just heard from a little bit ago, of the L-1011, so that he can make sure Pegasus has a smooth ride during this ferry flight. And then on launch day at Quadge, we will be on Kwajalein in the Launch Control Center, uh, prepping for launch and drop of the ICON mission. You know, Mick, that's a tough gig to have to go to Hawaii. I mean, I really have a lot of sympathy for you. <laughs> yeah, the engineering team and I, uh, you know, somebody's got to do it, but we're, we're excited. We're very excited to uh, be there with uh, Orbital ATK and LSP. Now, it's a long tradition for Orbital ATK to name the Pegasus XL rocket. And there's a name on the rocket that is very near and dear to our hearts from LSP. Mick, let's talk about her. Yeah, the tradition of naming the rocket is a great one. You know, we've had names from all over, but this year it's Icon Linda, uh, named after Linda Foster, one of our employees back at Launch Services Program. And Linda is such an amazing lady. She keeps the engineering team intact, the management team intact. You know, she makes LSP run. She's just one of the many people that keeps us launching rockets and, and our mission success. So Linda, here's to you. Go Icon. Thank you, Mick, and have a safe trip tomorrow. Back to Chris and Blair. Thanks, Tiffany. I tell you what, Blair, I'm, I'm getting really excited to see the Stargazer take off tomorrow morning. Did you get your, your bags packed and ready to go for the flight? Well, We're, if you Frank look, Frank and I are all ready to go. If you look closely during the launch, you might see signs of a stowaway. I'm not saying <laughs> anything, but I've been known to try to make a make a run for that before. Tell you what, you're watching NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA.